To the north of Leyendale, there are lands that are sealed, branded as forbidden and guarded by Malekith's followers, a path that few would dare to trade. However, for the desperate and determined lies a land shrouded by blizzards known as the Consecrated Snowfields. Consecrated, because these are the holy lands of Lord Mikla, the unalloyed and master of the Halig Tree. Mikla is one of the many demigods and in the base game we never interact with him directly, and yet it is clear the influence and wisdom this Empyrean wielded. Taking in those outcasts and overlooked by the Golden Order, Mikla would establish an unalloyed Gold Order, with the Halig Tree to oppose the Erd Tree, seeking to purify the perceived faults found within his father's regime. His love for the meek is eclipsed only by his love for his sister, Melania, who has been afflicted by the curse of an outer god of rot since birth. It is little surprise then that this would-be god is concerned with purity, to shrive clean the hearts of men and to purge the world of its corruption and interference from outside gods. In this lore video, we will be doing a comprehensive analysis on Mikla's lore thus far in preparation for the DLC, and so that this video may serve as a reminder of Mikla's lore before we got new information in the DLC. And so I hope you'll join me this week as we analyse the lore of Mikla the Unalloyed. At the onset of this video I'd like to do a few shout outs. Firstly I'd like to give a shout out to Eugenia Eliza, an extremely talented environment artist who gave me permission to use her St. Trina mock-ups as background for that chapter. Massive shout out to Eugenia and her channel and socials are linked below. And next I'd like to thank a few creators who discussed the subject of Mikola with me publicly and privately that allowed me to cement my ideas on the subject. Firstly Raditaskor, who discussed Mikola with me on a podcast which I will link below, as well as creators Cyrobe and Monster Maze who discussed these subjects with me privately. These are all great creators so please check them out. We know enough about Mikla's early years that we can paint a somewhat interesting picture of how Mikla was shaped in his youth. Morgoth, in his pre-fight rant, refers to Mikla and Melania as the twin prodigies. The twin prodigies, Mikla and Melania. This is an interesting detail about their birth that adds further context to their close bond, intertwining stories and opposing attributes which exist in balance with one another. We of course know that he and Melania were born of the Marika Radigan Union, as Melania's remembrance reads the following. Mikla and Melania are both the children of a single god. As such, they are both Imperians, but suffered afflictions from birth. One was cursed with eternal childhood, and the other harboured rot within. I have discussed this before in both my prior Mikla and Melania videos, but for the benefit of new viewers, the term a single god is not just a reference to Marika being the only god in the relationship, rather the language used here is referring to the single physical being that is the Marika and Radigan union. To confirm this, content creator Last Protagonist was kind enough to translate this remembrance for me, and it reads the following. Mikola and Melania, they are the children of the one person god, therefore the two are godmen. With this understanding in hand, we can see that the remembrance is telling us that the special circumstances of their birth, i.e. being born from a single divine being of two egos, was what led to them becoming Imperian. This is why the wording of Melania's remembrance suggests a causal link between their birth and becoming Imperian, as it says, as such, they are both Imperians. However, we also know from the lore that this isn't just an automatic process, you aren't just born an Empyrean, as Empyrean seems to be a status that is bestowed upon those being considered by the Greater Will to replace the preceding god. We learn this of course via Rani, an Empyrean herself, who says the following. I was once an Empyrean of the demigods. Only I, Mikola and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age. So each of them were chosen by a two fingers, and thus in the case of Mikola and Melania, they were chosen 
by their two fingers because of their auspicious birth. Indeed, it is quite the heritage to be born from the current god and the separate ego that inhabits her body. Melania's great rune lends further credence to the idea that the nature of the twins' birth should have made them great, as it reads, Melania is the daughter to Queen Marika and Radigan, and her great rune should have been the most sacred of all. We can of course apply this special status to Mikola as well, given he too has the same parentage, being born from the single-bodied god, and this should have made them special, and they are. They are two of the most powerful and impactful characters in the lands between. Their childhood does indeed seem to be celebrated at Halig Tree Town, where the town plaza sports a statue of Mikola and Melania as children, being embraced by a third figure. I've always believed that this is a statue of Marika embracing her children, but I know many disagree on this and believe it is more likely to be Godwin. I could also buy this, given the connections between Godwin and Mikola, that we will of course look at later. But either way, I still think this statue celebrates their youth, the twin prodigies that could herald in a new era. Yet the nature of this birth also seemingly came with some defects, as Melania's remembrance also tells us about the other defining elements of the twins' birth, that they were born cursed. Melania, of course, was born with the scarlet rot within her, and Mikola was born with eternal childhood. These two being cursed at an aesthetic level certainly does feel like a reference to the rampant inbreeding among medieval royal families, which of course would give rise to many defects. And given this is the Erdtree dynasty, and essentially their queen is a single physical being who has mated with herself, the illusion does seem clear. However, while that might be a thematic implication, we know that in the case of Melania at least, this isn't the literal cause of the curse that she has, the curse of the Scarlet Rot. This was nothing to do with the conditions of her birth, rather it is the result of the meddling of an outer god. The outer god of Rot, who has clearly chosen Melania as its new vessel. And if that's the case, what is the cause of Mikola's eternal childhood? Well, we could speculate a little on this. Firstly, regardless of Melania's situation, we do of course need to consider his parentage and genetics. His mother is a Numen, a race we know precious little about, but what we do know is fascinating. The character creator allows a Numen appearance preset, and the description for this preset describes the race in the following way. The face of the Numen, supposed descendants of denizens of another world, long lived but seldom born. So Marika's people are beings who came from another world, they are alien to this one, and indeed as I've discussed before, the Japanese name for these beings are Marabito. In Japanese folklore, Marabito are supernatural beings or spirits who come from another world bringing wisdom or gifts. This is of course interesting in regards to what we've heard about Marika and her relationship to the Land of Shadows the setting of the upcoming DLC. Both the Bandai Namco website and the interviews with Miyazaki tell us that these are the lands where Marika first set foot in this world. Does this mean this is where the Numen first arrived from another world? Perhaps, but returning to the relevance this has to Mikla, his mother's people are no ordinary beings, they are long lived, and as such, this is why I've always assumed that Marika is called the Eternal, and why the Eternal Cities are also called as such, given they are inhabited by the Numen offshoot known as the Nox. And again, I refer you to my Nox video if you'd like to understand why these are Numen. Therefore, perhaps Mikla's Eternal Youth is a genetic heritage from his Eternal Ancestors. It's also said in that preset that the Numen are rarely born. This seemingly lines up with Miyazaki's concept of more advanced or powerful beings being less fertile than lower forms of life. For those unaware, this is an idea explored in the story of Bloodborne, where the highest forms of life in this world, the Great Ones, are essentially infertile. A lot of the game's main conflicts revolve around these great cosmic beings seeking surrogates and children, with Miyazaki himself confirming this in an interview first published in the Future Press Guide. So it seems as though the Numen inherit this thematic exploration of birth rates. By being a more powerful and longer living race, 
They also struggle to reproduce as quickly as the regular human races. Is it therefore possible that Mikola's curse is a combination of all these genetic factors? Eternal, but thanks to some genetic instability via the self-breeding and inherent issues with Numen reproduction, he was born eternally young rather than just eternal. Perhaps, and that is the most likely to me, however I could be wrong and he too was afflicted by the curse of some outer god or greater will itself. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Indeed, the few images that we have of Mikola present him as a youthful figure. The statue of him in Melania, the statues of him throughout the Halig Tree, and in Ordina, a liturgical town. And there is of course the opening slide to the game of Moog kidnapping a young Mikola. And then finally, we now have a glimpse of him in the new trailer for Shadow of the Earth Tree, and again, he appears to have that youthful appearance. Yet it doesn't seem as though Mikla's eternal youth has affected his wisdom, as it's clear that Mikla is one of the wisest among his kin. In Melania's armour set, she says that he has the wisdom of a god, and the fact Mikla helped his father develop Golden Order fundamentalism speaks volumes of his intelligence. If he was able to match or exceed his father's wisdom, himself a scholar. And of course, what Mikla achieves with the Halig Tree and his own leadership is extremely impressive, so clearly he isn't childlike in intelligence. But what about his outlook? What about his morals? I would argue that Mikla has retained a sort of childlike innocence or naivety, an idealised view of the world. He is someone who wants a world free from the meddling of the gods, a world where even the meek and the outcast can be embraced. It does seem very idealistic, and perhaps some would consider it to be the naivety of a child. Again, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As I mentioned in the intro to this video, a large part of Mikla's formative years will have been spent around his twin. It's clear that these two became immensely close, as is indicated by the rather moving statues of these two embracing found around the Halig Tree. There are also other reliefs found around Elfael which show two babies around a tree, and this is likely representative of Mikla and Melania as well. Of course, their bond is further illustrated by the fact that Melania, an Empyrean herself with almost unmatched strength, puts aside any of her own ambition to lead and becomes her brother's blade. She respects and loves her brother so much that she is happy to serve him as his blade despite her own ability to lead an incredible power. Of course, this love is reciprocated in kind, as Mikla's entire life goal seems to be, at least partially, inspired by his desire to free his sister from the clutches of the outer god of rot. Radigan's Rings of Light imply that finding a cure for his sister was the reason that he explored Golden Order fundamentalism with his father in the first place, meaning that him leaving the Golden Order and founding the Unalloyed Gold Order is a direct response to the perceived failings of the Golden Order and how it couldn't help his sister. It's also worth noting that Mikla seems to have carried over the miracles he developed for the Golden Order Fundamentalists into his own unalloyed order, as we can see his miracle being used by followers of his and his sister. We see it in the Clean Rot Knights. Some of them carry the Halo Scythe, which has the weapon art Mikla's Ring of Light, clearly a unalloyed variant of those original Fundamentalist incantations. Additionally, we see similar miracles wielded by the Albanorix found in the snowfield, clearly followers of Mikla, their eyes tinted by his gold. It's just another great storytelling detail, illustrating how Mikla took what he learned under Golden Order fundamentalism and applied it and reworked it for his own unalloyed order. But it is very moving when you consider that the beginnings of Mikla's entire new movement was in part inspired by his love for his sister, and his desire to cure her. Indeed, Melania's very armour is made from unalloyed gold, as we learn of this from its description, a further kindness shown to his suffering sister, providing prosthetics for her rotted limbs, while the gold helps forestall the rot's progression, as Melania desperately clings to her humanity. Of course, some of these efforts will have come later in his life, but the point being is that his sister was an important factor in the god he would become, one obsessed with scouring the earth clean of outside interference. It is this concept of self-determination that Mikla fights for, 
all those downtrodden, outcasts and persecuted by the will of the gods, all the lives who have been predetermined by the interference of faceless cosmic entities will be welcomed under Mikla's reign, freedom from cosmic oppression, an ideal developed watching his sister suffer, the pawn of an outer god, her life decided by something inhuman. As a young boy, this must have had a massive, formative effect on him. What I like is that we get further hints that his concept of an unalloyed gold order that would house his ideal surrounding purity and freedom was something that took root in his mind early on in his life. The description of Mikla's lily reads the following, a delicate water lily of unalloyed gold that has started to fade and wilt, a flower signifying faith in the halo tree, thought to be beloved by the Imperian Mikla in his youth. So Mikla loved this lily in his youth, far before he created his unalloyed order, yet it is clear that the idea of unalloyed gold was important to him from a young age. It therefore makes sense that when his father's order failed, he thought back to that unalloyed gold lily of his childhood, and a new path was chosen. So with that said, let us talk about the concept of unalloyed gold, and what it means for the current Golden Order. The term unalloyed is used a lot regarding Mikla, his miracles and his aims, and this does make perfect sense when you learn more about the Empyrean. The word unalloyed is generally a reference to metals, indicating that it's not an alloy and is pure. Gold is important to the current order, so it's hard not to see the term unalloyed gold as a direct response and criticism of the Golden Order itself. Mikla seeks to establish an unalloyed Golden Order, one free of the impurities and failings of the Golden Order itself. But what are these impurities? Well, if we go by the description of the unalloyed gold needle, a creation of Mikla, his aim seems to be freeing millennia, and more generally, removing the meddling of the outer gods from the world. Mikola clearly sees the meddling of gods as something that taints the purity of an order. This of course brings us to an overlap which no doubt some have already considered, the unalloyed gold of Mikola and the perfect order of Goldmask. Goldmask's quest is something I have detailed in its own separate video, and I would recommend that if you want a full analysis, but for this video I will go over the cliff notes. Goldmask comes to the lands between as a fundamentalist, attempting to find out why the Golden Order has failed. To the fundamentalists, the Golden Order is a perfected order, holistic, and a complete philosophy that should not have failed. Golden Order fundamentalism is not just a philosophy, but also scholarship, as is described by the Golden Order seal item description. As Tarnished Archaeologist has pointed out numerous times in many videos, the Golden Order totality gesture the one that Radigan is usually posed in, has echoes of the Vitruvian man of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was a man of the High Renaissance, and the Vitruvian man is his version of the idealised male form, a blend of scientific and artistic ideals. This thematically lines up with Radigan, a man who wanted to combine the scholarship and intellectual learnings of the sorcerers of Rhea Lucaria and Caria with the faith-based traditions of the Golden Order and the Erdtree peoples. Indeed, his icon tells us that he tries to combine these two schools of thoughts to perfect himself, and of course a massive shout out to Tarnished Archaeologist for making this apt comparison. So it isn't surprising then, with its scientific thematic underpinnings and logic, that Golden Order fundamentalism could also be understood in a mathematical sense, and indeed this seems to be the way that Goldmask tries to unpack the Golden Order to seek out its flaws. Indeed, Brother Corrin seems to interpret Goldmask's gestures as a sort of calculus, and in the middle of this computation, Goldmask stumbles across a curious anomaly. The Master's reflections had heightened as we neared the Erd Tree. While still a precise calculus, the rhythms grew increasingly wild until he simply ceased. Now the Master is facing quite the puzzle. The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true God. However, the name of Marika's second husband, King Consort Radigan, also appeared, 
Who exactly was Radigan? The master is stumped. His finger has remained still ever since Radigan's name was discovered. Marika is Radigan. Corin tells us that the Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. But Goldmask's calculations reveal this doesn't work or hold true because Marika holds another within her. With this revelation that the Golden Order is founded upon a lie, Goldmask's trust in the gods is shattered, and he travels to the forbidden, heretical Mount of Fire, much to Corrin's dismay. I've been gripped by a terrifying thought. The rhythms and calculus of the Master's finger betray a suspicion of the holism of the Golden Order, a conceit, I am afraid, that cannot be overlooked. Oh, but how could this be? I dread to even entertain the possibility, but somehow I cannot cast aside my doubts about the Master. Tell me, have I simply lost my head? Only, if the Master were true to the Golden Order, why would he think to breach this forbidden mount of fire? The implication is clear. Goldmask sees the gods as the issue. It's their very lies and very human actions that cause the failure of the system. The Golden Order as it stands, with the gods as part of it, caused it to fail, and the Elden Ring to shatter. As I've said, Corin believes that the Golden Order was founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god, and it's this founding principle that Goldmask takes issue with. It is no surprise then that Goldmask eventually conceives of a new Golden Order, one perfected by banishing the gods from it forever. As his Rune of Perfected Order reads, A Rune of Transcendental Ideology, which will attempt to perfect the Golden Order. The current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of the gods, no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment. From a visual standpoint, I have always seen the halo that surrounds this mending rune as a barrier that wards off the influence of the gods. And indeed, if you do choose to use this mending rune, in the ending cinematic you will see that this rune takes up a position of a shield that surrounds the entire Elden Ring. So, long tangent aside, it seems that on a surface level, there does seem to be a great deal of similarities between Goldmask and Mikola's ideologies. So where do they differ? Well, to me it's quite simple. Goldmask still sees the Golden Order as worthy of salvaging, it just needs to be perfected and tweaked. However, Mikola clearly does not. This is evident in him creating his own brand new Erd tree, separate from the current one. A new order, root and stem. For something truly pure, one must start from the beginning. At least, that is my speculation based on his action in moving away and starting something entirely new, fresh and uncorrupted. This is in line with what I've previously suggested about the Outer Gods, in the likes of my Outer God lore video. In this video, I suggested that the term Outer God isn't just a reference to their cosmic nature, but is also a commentary on their current status, the fact they are external to the current order. And again, shout out to Mirko, a translator that works with Sabako no Meiko, for first bringing this theory to my attention. They are currently outside of the Order, and yet they are not necessarily something that the Greater Well would exclude. Melania was born with the Scarlet Rot within her. She was chosen by the Outer God of Rot to herald in a new Order of Rot, becoming its god. Queen Marika and her King Consort Radigan were blessed with twin demigods and Melania was one of them. She was born an Empyrean carrying the Scarlet Rod. An Empyrean is no mere demigod. In the age of the Elden Ring and Queen Manica, the precious Empyrean was born a new god to forge a new order. Since Melania fought Radan, and the great Scarlet Flower blossomed in Aeonia, I have dedicated myself to her, and to the resplendence of the Order of Rot, the cycle of decay and rebirth. And yet, the Two Fingers, vassals of the Greater Well, still chose her to be an Empyrean, despite the fact she had the Scarlet Rot within her. 
and this to me speaks volumes. The Greater Well has no problem with there being an order of rot. In fact, it seems as though the Greater Well does not care what form order takes, as long as there is order. This is an argument made by Radataskar in a really great video which I will link below. But before Mark and Godfrey there was Placidusax as Elden Lord, it hasn't always been the Golden Order that was in charge. And a depiction of the Elden Ring found in Fire Missoula makes it feel like this was a very different configured Elden Ring, a different order altogether. It also doesn't matter how you repair the Elden Ring. Whether you implement Goldmask's perfected version of the Golden Order, or you curse the Elden Ring with Dung Eater's Blessing of Despair, or if you even herald in the Age of the Dustborn, bringing in those who live in death who were previously excluded, you are still anointed by the Greater Will as the Elden Lord in each of these cases. The Greater Will doesn't care as long as there is a new order, and therein lies Mikola's issue with the current way of things. This is why there is no cure to be found for his sister in the current Golden Order, because it allows for the Outer God's interference. In Mikola's purified, unalloyed order, there would be no such tolerance for this interference. And so he has to start from the beginning. For him, there is no salvaging the current Golden Order. Mikola seeks something new and purer. And with that understanding of what unalloyed really means, I want to talk about Mikola's character. I had previously mentioned that Mikola may possess a childlike, idealised vision for the world. And this brings me to the inevitable, heroic concept discussion. Radataskor does a great series on this, and I would highly recommend that you check it out, and I will link some of these videos below. But to summarise, Ratataskar references a quote from Miyazaki that comes from a pre-release interview with PlayStation, where Miyazaki said the following. He created these very heroic and grandiose designs, essentially these demigods from the history of Elden Ring's world, so we wanted to take what he provided us and create a new core for these characters and how we design them. From the boss designs that we've revealed so far, the one that I feel is a good match for how we take a heroic concept and twist and misshape it due to the power of the Elden Ring shards, is Godric the Grafted. He is an excellent example of this, because he encompasses that feeling of sadness and frustration when a lord comes to the end of his reign, trying to cling desperately to the power he still has left. In this way, Godric is a great embodiment of that new design approach. In another interview with Game Informer, Miyazaki elaborates further on how it was up to From Software to warp the heroic templates that George had drawn up, to break these grand heroes, twist and distort them, something noble that has become tainted. In Rathataskar's series on the heroic concept, he takes the idea beyond Godric, trying to identify the nobility of each of the demigods, a nobility that has now been twisted into something perverse. For example, in Rathataskar's video on Rykard, he identifies Rykard as a hero of rebellion, of agnegation, and there is certainly something noble about rebellion and that desire for freedom, dependent on one's perspective of course. Indeed, even the Gaelmere knights who initially followed him believed it was a noble cause, despite its inherent blasphemous nature. While this was initially Rykard's goal, a noble one, it has been consumed by his desire to gain power to achieve this end. You see, Rykard desired power to beat the Ard Tree, to defeat it, and as such he allowed himself to be devoured by the Serpent of Gelmir. And now that hunger for power has become the aim in of itself. He is no longer the Lord of Rebellion, he is the Lord of Greed. So let's apply this theory to Mikla himself. That Mikla is possessing a noble spirit, but through the shards of the Elden Ring that could become corrupted and perverted somehow. Well, for me, Mikla is someone who is concerned with purity, of course. As we've discussed, the term unalloyed itself evokes images of something that is pure. Mikla wants an unalloyed world, a pure world, free from the taint of meddling celestial entities. How could this become twisted? Could Mikla's heroic element become warped and he is the final hidden boss of the DLC? Well, yes, absolutely. Because when does one's quest for purity become a purge? Certainly some interesting concepts to ponder as we approach the DLC. 
There is another idea though regarding Mikola's heroic element and what he stands for, what his new order would stand for. Mikola really has a problem with outside forces influencing the lands between. In the case of Melania, it's pretty plain to see why he would not like this. She does suffer, but there's something more important. Melania fights her entire life to retain herself, her sense of individuality, the ability to make her own choices, but the Scarlet Rot forces her down a path that is not of her own choosing. By the end of her story, it doesn't matter who Melania wants to be, the Scarlet Rot will always out. She is being robbed of her own right to self-determination. So while purity is important to Mikla, that might just be a means to an end. That end being individuals' right to their own self-determination. The idea of choice, fate, free will, and self-determination is one of the biggest overarching themes in Elden Ring. From Rani shedding her Imperian flesh in order to free herself of the control of the Two Fingers, to the decision of the Tarnished themselves. For if Marika predicted our return and eventual succession, and if we are guided by Grace and we are armed by Marika's blacksmith, did we actually make a decision at all? If we choose to become Elden Lord, no matter our reasons for doing so, have we just been pawns the entire time? Or is the only true decision we can make of our free will to burn it all down to spite this system of control? Or are we just being manipulated by another cosmic force even in this choice? There's also the tragedy of Blythe, a warrior defiant to the fate he was born into. He chooses Rani, he chooses her rebellion, but at the very end he is still undone by his own nature, his preordained fate. He is punished by the greater will for daring to have free will. And as we've already said, the most pertinent example of free will being explored in Elden Ring is that of Melania. A woman who wants to have her own identity as a warrior and yet is forced to become the Goddess of Rot. The Goddess of Rot is just a tool of the outer god of Rot and Melania and her identity that she crafted through her long life is erased in a moment. So it isn't just the greater will that manipulates mortals for its own ends. Each of the outer gods that we encounter seem to be manipulating mortals to achieve their aims, a sort of Game of Thrones between them. Without the interjection of these outer gods, these mortals might have lived very different lives. They are being manipulated and their free will stripped for the use of a cosmic being. What I find really revealing about Mikola's view of the outer gods is the wording used in Mikola's needle, as it reads the following. One of the unalloyed gold needles that Mikola crafted to ward away the meddling of the outer gods. The term meddle suggests that Mikola sees them as beings who interfere in the life of mortals, and interfering with their ability to live truly free. He certainly developed this view by witnessing what happened to his sister, how her entire life has been dominated and directed by the influence of a cosmic being. She did not choose this, and she is not free to live her own life and make her own decisions. So Mikola seeks to remove the influence of the outer gods from this world, so that we may be the masters of our own destiny, to protect individualism and to protect free will. So in short, I believe that Mikola's heroic concept is one of purity or freedom, but his order, the unalloyed order that he wants to implement, could be seen as the order of free will, at least that's my interpretation. Although this is quite ironic when we look at Mikola's more alluring and bewitching aspects in the next chapter. But it seems as though under Mikola's reign, no outer gods would design the course of fate for the world. Only the earthbound lord and ruling body will do what is best for their people. And already at this early point in the discussion regarding Mikola, we can see why serving him might be so appealing. And with that said, let us now talk about the lands of Mikola, his regime and his followers. We've mentioned Mikola's history with the Golden Order. The Discus of Light and Radigan's Ring of Light item description tell us a narrative. That narrative being that Mikola helped his father develop the miracles of Golden Order fundamentalism, and that he had a motive for doing so. When no answer could be found to cure his sister, he abandoned the Golden Order to find a new way to banish the Outer Gods. 
this was the start of unalloyed gold. We can presume then it was at this stage that Mikola moved to the lands where the Halig tree now stands, and we learn a little bit about the birth of this tree via the Halig tree crest surcoat which reads the following. The surcoat bears the crest of the Halig tree. Though watered with Mikola's own blood since it was a sapling, the Halig tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd tree. So Mikola grew this tree from when it was a sapling into what it is now. And there is another important factor to consider here, something I identified in my Mikola video two years ago. There are two Erd tree avatars present here at Elfail at the Halig tree which has big lore implications for the tree itself. These avatars play a special role in the lands between. The staff of the avatar, the weapons that they wield, read the following. The avatars, emerging in the wake of the Elden Ring shattering, were determined to protect the withering Erdtree's offspring. So these avatars are usually found in locations around a minor Erdtree, or the Erdtree itself as is the case with the avatar found in Lane Dell. If the avatars are here at the Halig Tree, defending it, that can only mean one thing. The Halig Tree itself is a minor Erd Tree. Mikola either took it as a sapling or a seed to this new site, planted it, and watered it with his own blood. The description of the surcoat says it failed to grow into an Erd Tree, implying that this was the goal to grow a new Erd Tree. It makes sense then that Mikola would choose a minor Erd tree if this was his goal, watering it with his own Imperian blood to no doubt help it grow and infuse it with his power. And it did grow, it is far bigger than any other minor Erd tree. This is also likely why the Halig tree is called the Halig tree, which basically means holy tree. As for those who worship and follow Mikola, a tree grown from his blood would indeed be a holy thing. Indeed, Mikola the Unalloyed has a following unlike any other. Yes, there are other leaders who demand respect like Radan or Melania, but Mikola is seen as holy and is worshipped as if he is a god already. This is why so much of the language associated with Mikola and his domain are related to holiness. For example, the snowy lands that mark the entrance to his domain are the consecrated snowfields. The Halig tree is the holy tree, and the town that marks the entrance to the Halig tree itself is called Ordina Liturgical Town. Part of the reason that the consecrated snowfields might be considered holy is because they are the lands that pilgrims must travel through to reach Ordina and the Halig tree beyond. The map for the area reads, The route through this land crossed east to west by a frozen river leads to Mikla's Halig tree. This is the path taken by those unchosen, though it is a trial all the same suggesting that passage through this land is a trial for those who wish to prove themselves worthy of entrance to the Halig Tree. Indeed, we do see what appear to be pilgrims travelling through the blizzards in the consecrated snowfields. And it's why his warriors are more zealous than any other. Even the city, Elfeil, may have holy connotations. As far as I can tell, there is no word Elphael, however it cleaves very close to the biblical name Eliphal, which means God has judged or whom God judges. Mikola's men also bear a sacred crown atop their heads, so named by the helmet of the same name. The sacred crown seems to take the form of a golden wreath of branches, and it's hard not to see the comparison to Christ and his crown of thorns. To me, Mikla very much occupies the Messiah or Chosen One archetype in Elden Ring. To those who follow him, there is an inevitability about his eventual reign, and indeed, his act of attempting to grow his own Erd Tree is audacious in its intent and statement. Even the warriors of Mikla have the honour of bearing a holy tree upon their breast, in opposition to the forces of Laendel. Mikla's order is a direct challenge to the order of Laendel. What Mikla has achieved at El Fail is extremely impressive, a capital that can very much rival Lane Dell, especially given some more time. It is impressive aesthetically, of course, wrapping around the Halig tree much as Lane Dell surrounds the Erd tree. However, what is more interesting is that there is a real culture here, a town plaza in Halig tree town, 
religious spaces and chapels, outside gazebos and other social spaces, as well as evidence of burial customs. El Fael has been made to stand independent of the rest of the lands between, preparation for it becoming the new capital under Mikla's order. It's clear that Mikla, seeing the deep flaws in the Golden Order, has established his own to rival the gods themselves. Instead of an Erd tree stands the Halig tree, and in opposition to the Golden Order stands the unalloyed Gold Order. The Golden Order is impure and cannot be fixed. A new one must be built from the ground up to replace it. It would be hard to resist such powerful symbolism, especially if you were one who felt excluded or downtrodden by the dogma and rules of the Golden Order. Indeed, Mikla is seen to be a protector of the weak, as is described by the Sacred Crown Helm, the helmet worn by Mikla's foot soldiers, which reads, Flanged iron cap adorned with a crown of unalloyed gold, worn by foot soldiers sworn to the Halig Tree. Who is it that Mikla shall bless, if not the low and the meek? For me, this is why we find the likes of the Albanorix and the Misbegotten seeking shelter in Mikla's lands, as he is gracious enough to offer them shelter from the persecution of the Golden Order. If Mikola outright rejects the Golden Order, it makes sense that he would also reject their prejudices. We find the Misbegotten all around Halig Tree Town, and I personally believe the Misbegotten have been granted shelter here, given we find at least a couple of them seemingly kneeling or praying before Mikola's statues as if they venerate or worship him. However, it is worth noting there is a different theory one that was posited by Tarnished Archaeologist. In the video on Omen and Misbegotten, Tarnished Archaeologist proposes the idea that the Misbegotten found here are invaders, and this is why we have a Misbegotten Crusader in the consecrated snowfields, and I would recommend you check out that video if you'd like to see the reasoning for that theory. The Albanorcs are among the most hated and oppressed lifeforms in the lands between, and it all stems from their artificial nature. This is best described by the greatest lore item in the game, the Albanoric Blood Clot, which reads the following. Albanorics are lifeforms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. Because of the Golden Order's dogmatic view on life, and all of it being connected to the Erd Tree, the Albanorics are considered to be impure, as they are not natural lifeforms that would be connected to the Erd Tree and its burials. We can see they are hunted for sport in Liurnia via the Albanoric pot, crafted by the Cuckoos as a weapon. Its description reads the following. The knights of the Cuckoo do declare, Behold thy defiled blood, unlike any humour that flows in our grand realm. This level of hatred is most likely quite common throughout the lands between, seeing them as nothing more than vermin, not true life that is worthy of empathy. We can see the level of prejudice that's directed at the Tarnished, for example, another group of people lacking grace, and we can only assume how difficult things would be for a fully artificial race. However, the outright disdain by the Albanorix, shown by the Cuckoo here, is no worse than the casual disregard that others show towards them. I of course refer to the massacre at Albanoric Village, which we are told by Latena was perpetrated by the All-Knowing and his goons. Gideon is searching for access to the consecrated snowfields, the lands of Mikola, and he has heard that the Albanorcs hold the key, literally. And this is literally the reason why Gideon massacres an entire village of people. He wants to know more about Mikola. That is it. He has massacred an entire village of people just so he can learn more. And seeing such cruelty, it is no wonder that the Albanorc people look to the consecrated snowfields and Mikola for their salvation as there is good reason that the Albanorcs hold half of the seal that leads to the consecrated snowfield. As Mikla's lands are essentially a fabled promised land to the Albanoric people, the promised land to which they will one day travel and be free from the brutality of the lands of grace. A chosen land awaits us, Albanorics. The medallion is the key that leads to the city. It's only a quaint treasure for we who cannot make the journey. But for dear Latena, it is needed to fulfill her purpose. This is what Mikla is for these people, for the outcasts. He is hope, he is a future, and he is freedom. The Albanorcs are indeed present in Mikla's lands, 
some even imbued with his unalloyed gold, and are able to practice his miracles. The female archer variant also seem to guard the entrance to the Halig Tree itself, being in an around Ordina liturgical town, perhaps a service to their saviour. Most importantly, Mikola harbours the Albanorics best chance for the future, in the form of the towering sister Philia. O oh, young yet towering sister of ours, let the birthing droplet in and create life for us, for all the Albanorics. The fabled land of the Albanoric were lightly discovered by the Carrion Knight known as Loretta, who now acts as a Knight of Mikola and Guardian of Elfeil. We know this thanks to the description of her helmet which reads the following. Loretta, once a royal Carrion Knight, went on a journey in search of a haven for Albanorix, and determined that the Halig Tree was their best chance for eventual salvation. This narrative is reinforced by the description of Loretta's mastery, and ultimately together they paint a picture of someone who is deeply sympathetic to the Albanorix and was ready to sacrifice for them, a rarity in Liurnia, the hunting ground of the Cuckoos after all. There is a good chance that Loretta is merely an empathetic soul, a human, sickened by the cruelty of the Cuckoos that she likely would have witnessed firsthand. However, the description of the mirror shield, the one that she bears, alludes to another possibility of the source of her empathy towards the Albanorix, as it reads, Shield of Radiant Silver, festooned with amber, and carried by Loretta, Knight of the Halig Tree. The shape is said to imitate that of a sacred drop of dew, which inspired the absurd rumour that Loretta herself was an Albanoric. Now, firstly, as a bit of background, why does this suggest that she may have been an Albanoric just because it shows a drop of dew? Well, this is to do with the origins of the Albanorics themselves, which is hinted at via the description of the Ripple Blade, which reads, Unique weapon wielded by young Albanorics. This sword is modelled after the ripples that are thought to be the origin of their species. This alchemical origin is also represented by the design of the Albanoric shield, the item description for which reads, Tall oval shield made of metal carried by young Albanorics. The ornamentation represents the primordial drop of dew from which they are said to have been created. Now, again, I discuss this in a lot of detail in my Albanoric lore video, but there is some content that heavily hints that the Albanorics are creations of the Nox, of the Eternal Cities. This mainly comes from a cut dialogue from Tops, who outright told us that these were creations of the Eternal Cities. And this makes sense, as the Eternal Cities are well versed in alchemy and artificial life. There was also a cut quest with the Silver Tears. A silver mimic tear called Asimi would have asked us to go to the origins of her people, which would have been a chalice found in the Eternal Cities. In the game, the Eternal Cities are also known for various alchemical concoctions, such as the Puppet Draft and the Celestial Dew. And given the Albanorics are artificial in nature, the implication of all of this is that the Albanorics were created from an alchemical concoction of some kind, most likely originating in the Eternal Cities. As such, the Albanoric weapons, the Ripple Blades, seem to emulate the origin of their species, and this is why Loretta's shield is suspicious to some. Of course, we also have to consider where we receive Loretta's shield. We get it at the location of the conclusion of Latena's quest, the apostate derelict church, near the towering sister herself. It is hard to ignore the significance of this location to the Albanorix, and thus it could be seen as circumstantial evidence that Loretta is an Albanoric. And there is more here that could maybe tie Loretta to the Albanoric species that under that armour is indeed an Albanoric. Whilst the vast majority of evidence points to the Eternal Cities being the creators of the Albanorix at least in the first instance, there is a cut item description for the silver blue armour the armour worn by the female Albanorix, and this was detailed by Zuli the Witch in their Albanoric video. This old description attributes the creation of the female Albanorix to the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. This is cut content so we are free to disregard it, however I do think we can still make this fit with the Eternal City theory as well. And I do need to give credit to Loki here because it was in a private discussion with me that Loki first presented this theory how we can make 
both of these fit. The idea that it was the Eternal Cities that first created the Albanorix, but Rhea Lacarians later tampered with it. Let's speculate that the Eternal Cities did create the Albanorix in the first instance, but abandoned the project as it didn't have the results they were hoping for. The Albanorix are flawed, the first generation seemed to have to crawl on their hands and knees, and the second generation cannot speak. They then migrated above ground and now exist in Liurnia, at which point Rhea Lucaria, in the vicinity, attempted to perfect this failed formula, and the female Albanorix were the result, a slightly modified version of the first generation, ones that are far more useful, and that Loretta was the best, the pinnacle of this period of experimentation, and was given to the Carrions as a new royal guard. It's just a theory, mind you, but one that makes all the pieces fit. Indeed, there are elements of Loretta's design that do line up with the Albanorix, the female Albanorix. One can't help but note, we never see her on her feet. Does she also have problems with her legs like the female Albanorix do, and have to ride a mount? And of course, both Loretta and the Albanorix females are both excellent mounted archers, albeit Loretta uses a more powerful, magical-only bow. As often is the case with speculative subjects, I leave it up to you to decide what you believe, but either way it's clear that Loretta is a gallant character and a powerful ally for Mikola. What is interesting is that Loretta clearly offered her services to Mikola upon finding these lands for the Albanorix, and we can assume that in exchange, Mikola would allow the Albanorix to come and settle here. Another thing that's interesting is that Loretta clearly sought to bring her carrion knightly practices to the Halig Tree. Loretta's war sickle reads the following, originally given for service as a personal guard to carrion royalty, the weapon's blue glintstone has been replaced with unalloyed gold. This carrion knight replaced her blue glintstone of Caria with unalloyed gold, signifying her change of allegiance from the house of Caria to the Halig Tree. As I have also argued in the past, I also think the tree emblem found on her helmet is a later adornment grafted on to her original carrion armour, meant to signify her allegiance to the Halig Tree. But she clearly hasn't abandoned her carrion training altogether. She still has her silver armour, and there's evidence she tried to bring the practices of the carrion knights to the Halig Tree. The carrion knights who Loretta once served alongside were all well armed with their signature blades, well made and imbued with glintstone, so they could also be used as catalysts for their signature carrion spells. This is why I find it so interesting that we find a Mikulin sword at the Halig Tree that is very similar in design to the carrion knight sword, and its description reads the following. Sword forged by servants of Mikula of the Halig Tree, with a design modelled after those carried by carrion knights. Instead of glintstone, however, amber from the Halig Tree is embedded in the blade, a sumptuous piece, yet it has never been offered to any knight, an ill-starred sword with no master. Mikola has regular knights, ones that follow the template of other lords, but the carrion knights are in a league of their own, above any of the other factions, an elite order that were a match for the forces far bigger than theirs. It's clear that Loretta wanted to repay Mikola's kindness with a new order of elite, carrion-style knights but sadly this did not come to fruition for whatever reason. There are other refugees found here at the Halig Tree, such as the sorcerers of the Hema Discipline, who we can assume have entered Mikola's service just because of the promise he represents, or perhaps they had fallen out with their fellows at Rhea Lucaria. Either way, they are another powerful ally for Mikola to add to his ranks. In Elfeil, we can also find Putrid Crystallians, I have argued in the past that these could possibly be here for Melania rather than Mikla, given they are of the putrid variety and thus infected by the Scarlet Rot, and perhaps this compels them to be near the Goddess of Rot and serve her. We don't know that for certain, however. Crystallians are inscrutable, inhuman beings. Perhaps they were infected after they came to the Halig Tree and they were already here to serve Lord Mikla, perhaps seeing something in his promise, future and fate. I would also like to take a moment here to discuss Ordina Liturgical Town and its significance, as well as its inhabitants. As I mentioned, the term liturgical has religious undertones, and as it is the final stop 
on one's journey to the sacred Taylor tree, it would be considered sacred to the faithful. It is ultimately the entrance to the holy tree. We've already offered an explanation as to why there are Albanorics here. They are likely guarding the entrance to Mikla's realm in return for him offering them sanctuary here. But there's another unique aspect to the liturgical town. There is a seal that blocks off the teleporter, a seal with Mikla's symbol on it. And this seal is actually protected by four candles that exist within an Everjail. Everjails in general appear to be a sort of pocket dimension that spatially exists outside the terrestrial realm. This is commonly used as a sort of prison, like the Phantom Zone from Superman, a place where dangerous beings can be removed spatially from the lands between without the potential issues that a conventional prison might offer. Mikola implementing an Everjail here is a unique use of it, as it is instead used as an additional layer of security for the Halig Tree, meaning the tree cannot be breached by conventional means. It is likely only a secret shared to the faithful, perhaps the final part of their pilgrimage. After all, what you do in the Everjail does feel religious. You go around lighting candles of a statue of Mikola. It's very ritualistic. But my main reason for bringing up Ordina now is to talk about its other inhabitants, the Black Knife Assassins. Now, my first theory as to why they are here is in line with what I've been saying in this chapter, that they too have been offered sanctuary in the lands of Mikola. Following the Night of the Black Knives, they would need such protection. Why would they need sanctuary? Well, as I've argued in my Rani and Night of the Black Knives videos, I suggest that Rani hung the assassins out to dry following the assassinations. We know from Taiki's ashes that the assassins were hounded and hunted following the murders, Taiki herself dying protecting her mother during their escape. Indeed, we find a battered and bloodied assassin in Sage's cave in Altus Plateau near Lane Dell, as if they fled here, barely escaping with their life after being hounded from the capital. And in general, we often seem to find the Black Knife assassins in the hidden and deep places of the world, as if they have been driven into hiding. Yet we find their ringleader, Alecto, imprisoned in Rani's domain of Moonlight Altar. To me it suggests that Rani wanted to sweep the conspiracy under the rug and her connections to it following the assassination, as she had got what she wanted from it, i.e. the shedding of her Imperian flesh. And without Rani's protection, the Black Knife assassins were just left to be hunted down. I have also suggested that this betrayal is the reason that Black Knife assassins seemingly come for Rani and her vassals near the end of her quest, killing E.G. and the others being killed by Blythe at Caria Manor, suggesting they were here for the princess herself. So these are definitely a people in need of protection. Would it not be better to act as guards for a benevolent welcoming lord than to be hunted in the lands of grace? I certainly think so, and these assassins do seem like they are patrolling Ordina as if they are guards, working alongside the Albanorix. In prior videos I have also even gone as far to suggest that they may have been the ones that built Ordina liturgical town for Mikola. It shares the same architecture as Celia, and as I suggest in my Black Knife Assassin video, I believe Celia was the place that the Black Knife Assassins were armed, given its connections to the Eternal Cities and its connections to assassination magic, magics that can conceal the assassins from sight. But what do you think? Do you agree that these Black Knife assassins are people that have been granted sanctuary by Mikla and in return they act as his guards? Or do you think he trapped them here when they came for him in the Night of the Black Knives? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Overall, however, it's clear that Mikla has a great following, and it is easy to see him as a kind and benevolent lord who protects anyone under his aegis, his arms wide open to those who are not used to such kindness. It's certainly a compelling notion and it's easy to see why people would be drawn to this idealistic cause, but of course Mikla is well aware of his ability to incite fervent belief in him and his cause. This is of course a reference to the description of the bewitching branch, which reads the following. The Imperian Mikla is loved by many people, Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. And of course, it's worth noting what this branch is actually used for. It's used to turn people against their senses and against their allies. Obviously, the word compel here adds a rather sinister element to Mikla's otherwise rather positive depiction 
in the lands between. The source of the branch's power is unalloyed gold. The description for the branch says tree branch blessed with an incantation of unalloyed gold. And it's a craftable and when you craft it you have to use one of Mikola's unalloyed gold lilies. So yes, unalloyed gold, Mikola's power, is the source of this bewitching curse. We can emulate this power using this branch, but it's implied that Mikola just naturally has this power, that he can compel people at will. It also ties back to the item description of Melania's armor set. This item description contains a quote from Melania. In this, she says, he possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. We've already discussed his wisdom, but now we start to understand what Melania means when he has the allure of a god. He can literally compel people, draw people in with his powers. Indeed, this would make him the most fearsome of all. Some of Mikla's warriors are so fervent in their belief of the Empyrean that they detonate themselves as an offensive power. We see this at El Fael, and it is described in the Halig Tree Soldier Ashes, which read, Spirits of common soldiers who carry the sacred light. When weakened, they explode to deliver a last ditch attack. This was the bitter revelation discovered by the desperate soldiers who awaited the return of their lord to the rotted halig tree. May the flash of our deaths guide Mikola's return. I personally have no doubt that a large number of Mikola's followers do follow him legitimately without being compelled. As we've discussed throughout this video, a lot of Mikola's philosophy is very compelling, and for others there's no choice but to follow Mikola, like the Albanorks and Misbegotten who have no place anywhere else. However, the extreme and fervent belief that his followers have in him does seem to suggest that Mikola's power may have something to do with this. It's hard not to question all of Mikola's relationships with these powers in mind. Was Melania affected by this power? A powerful demigod herself, she is so devoted to her own brother. Is this beyond her true feelings? Did she devote herself to him as his blade because of his power? We'll never know. But what is clear is that Mikla is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. He may not have the physical strength, but he has Melania and Loretta at his side, as well as a huge force of fervent, zealous followers who would do anything for their lord. But perhaps the most interesting thing about his bewitching powers is perhaps the irony it has for Mikola's character and goals. It clashes in an ironic way with what I discussed earlier, that Mikola seems to be concerned with self-determination and removing the meddling influence of the outer gods. Yet here we have evidence that Mikola has the power to effectively take away the free will of others to achieve his ends. This does very much fit into what we'd expect from Miyazaki and the corruption of the heroic concept. Mikola, so obsessed with ridding the meddling of the outer gods, himself begins to meddle in the free will of others. Now, we have at length discussed the followers of Mikola and his regime, however there's another relationship we need to discuss before moving on, and that's the relationship between Mikola and Godwin. I have spoken of how Mikla is seen as a guardian for the outcasts of Erdtree society, but there is of course one final group that falls under this category, those who live in death, and it does seem as though Mikla's sympathy extends to them as well, or at least to their master, Godwin the Prince of Death. One element I skipped over regarding Mikla's childhood in the earlier chapter is his potential relationship with Godwin. Godwin was a scion of the Golden Lineage, a product of Marika's first marriage to Godfrey. We know from a war memorial found in Leyendale that Godwin would become renowned during the capital's war with the dragons, as this monument reads, The routing of the ancient dragons. Godwin the Golden fought to the last, earning the friendship of dread Fortisax. Not only was he lauded for his courage during the conflict, but he's also responsible for mending the gap between the dragons and Lindell, becoming a friend to Fortisax. Fortisax and his sister Lansax would go on to establish the dragon cult of Altus Plateau, which would become an important part of the warrior culture of Lindell. Godwin's epithet, the Golden, not only signifies his relation to the Golden lineage, 
but to me it shows how highly regarded he was. Given the respect he inspired in Mikla of all people, this speaks volumes about his reputation. With all that said, it becomes clear that Godwin was still present in Leyendel by the time Mikla and Melania were born. There is a particular sword which hints at the closeness between Godwin and Mikla, the Golden Epitaph, which reads the following. A sword made to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden, first of the demigods to die, infused with the humble prayer of a young boy. O brother, Lord brother, please die a true death. The young boy, of course, makes us think of the youthful countenance of Mikla, and Mikla fits the identity of a young boy who is also brother to Godwin. A more concrete piece of evidence that this sword is tied to Mikla is that the Golden Epitaph's weapon art produces the sigil of Mikla when used, leading us to conclude that the prayer on the item description is from Mikla, and its intent is directed towards Godwin. The connection between Godwin and Mikla is reinforced by the fascinating location of Castle Sol, which seems to be home to those who venerate the Eclipse. I explain the Eclipse and its relation to death in more detail in my Deathbird video, and I would direct you to that if you want a more in-depth dive on that subject. But in short, the worshippers of the Eclipse believe that the Eclipse can be beckoned to swallow the sun, and thus return life to soulless bones. Hence, it seems this entire castle has become one that worships the Eclipse, as is evidenced by the legendary weapon found here, the Eclipse Shotel, which reads, In Sol, the sight of an Eclipse inspires dreadful awe, preventing an onlooker from averting his gaze. Commander Niall, the current military commander of this castle and the boss that you face here, also seems to lead these spirits found here, presumably in defence of its mission. Of course, this is the same character model as Commander O'Neill, found in Caled, who I've speculated before of being a commander in Radan's army, given his Red Lion banner. It's likely that Niall was once in a similar position, yet he has now chosen to be a custodian of this castle. As his prosthesis reads, Commander Niall, veteran of Castle Saul, offered this prosthesis in exchange for the lives of defeated knights held prisoner. He went on to lead these men as an army of no nation. However, beyond Niall is the NPC of true significance here at Castle Saul, the spirit whom Niall was presumably guarding, the NPC where we get the connection to Mikla, as this NPC at the top of Castle Saul says the following. This ghost directly addresses Lord Mikla and alludes to an arrangement between the two. This castle's custodian would research the Eclipse as a way to return Mikla's comrade's soul, and in return, this custodian would gain access to the Halig Tree, which is obviously why he's in possession of half of the Halig Tree medallion. Given the Golden Epitaph's description and its hints of Mikla's ties to Godwin, it should be no surprise that the soulless individual been spoken about here is none other than Godwin. Mikola has effectively tasked the people of this castle to use the Eclipse to find a way to return Godwin's soul to his body. This is a Mikola backed operation. It serves to highlight Mikola's empathy for those more brutally discarded by the Golden Order. The fundamentalists see those who live in death as nothing more than a pollution to be killed and purged whereas Mikla appears to want to undo the damage of the death route and restore the soul to the soulless. This of course could just be because he feels love for his brother, and the fact he would go this far to try and help his brother really does get the imagination going as to their relationship when he was a young boy. I would direct you back to that statue found at the Halig Tree that many believe is Godwin embracing Mikla and Melania. Perhaps he was an important nurturing figure 
in their formative years, and that is why Mikla is trying so hard to restore Godwin's soul. But perhaps I am wrong, and this is less an act of empathy, and rather it's just further evidence of Mikla's quest for true purity. Unlike the Golden Order, Mikla is not content to sweep the issue under the rug, rather he seeks to solve the issue permanently, removing this flaw in the system for good. This is definitely possible, as let us return to the Golden Epitaph. It is a weapon that deals holy damage, which strikes stronger against those who live in death. And its weapon art, one that is associated with Mikla, I'll remind you, seems to be most useful in killing those who live in death, as this weapon art buffs holy damage and prevents them from resurrecting. Both can be true, of course, it can be partially out of a desire for purity and out of empathy for his brother. And I leave it up to you to decide what the truth is. There's of course another rather interesting subject we must tackle when talking about Mikla, and this is of course the mysterious figure known as Saint Trina. Before we tackle the potential connection between Trina and Mikla, let's unpack what we do actually know about Trina. The most interesting item related to the saint is the Sword of Saint Trina, which reads the following. Silver sword carried by clerics of Saint Trina inflicts sleep ailment upon foes. Saint Trina is an enigmatic figure. Some say she is a comely young girl, others are sure he is a boy. The only certainty is that their appearance was as sudden as their disappearance. This is an interesting item description and it tells us a few things about Saint Trina. The first thing that catches my eye is that this is a sword wielded by clerics of Saint Trina. This means there are people who worship Saint Trina and there's a religion based around her. And indeed, as we'll look at shortly, there was some cut content regarding a monk of Saint Trina, but again we'll get to that shortly. The description of the sword mainly focuses on the appearance of Saint Trina, which is interesting for the discussion in regards to Mikola. We can see the appearance of Saint Trina depicted artistically on the Saint Trina torch as well, and we could certainly see how the ambiguous depiction of Saint Trina could be mistaken for the young Mikola. Indeed, it is Saint Trina's appearance where the first overlap between the saint and Mikola occur. Mikola too has the appearance of a fair young boy, and one could mistake him for a young girl, especially in the depictions we find of him around the Halig tree. The main takeaway from the sword and the depiction found on the Saint Trina torch is that the appearance of Saint Trina very much lines up with the appearance of Mikola. The crossover between the two characters continues when we look at another item associated with Saint Trina, the Saint Trina Lily, which reads the following. A light purple water lily that is on the verge of wilting, a symbol of faith in Saint Trina, dulls the senses, preventing agitation. The wording here clearly mirrors that of Mikola's lily, and the design aesthetically of both lilies are more or less the same just with a colour change, and it seems too close to be coincidence. And to me, even at this point, Saint Trina either has to be Mikola, an alter ego of his, or as is the case with Marika and Radigan, Saint Trina is literally another persona that occupies the same body as Mikola. What Saint Trina stands for also has an interesting thematic overlap with Mikola as well, as Saint Trina appears to be the deity or saint associated with dreams and sleep. The effects of Saint Trina's sword, arrow, pots, are to put the target to sleep. The dream elements of Saint Trina would have been far expanded in some cut content, in the NPC quest surrounding Rico, and if you'd like a more in-depth look at said quest, I would direct you to Lance McDonald, who was able to recreate elements of this quest from the network test. And the fact that this was found in the network test version of the game shows you how close this was to being in the actual game. This was something that was cut very close to launch, and therefore in my opinion we can't as easily disregard it as we would other cut content. This is something that was almost in the base game as it is now, and I think we can give greater credence to the lore found within this quest. In short, this quest would involve an NPC called Rico. Rico would identify himself as a follower of Saint Trina and ask you to help him brew something called Dream Brew. This would require you to gather Slumber Fog, a sort of dream essence that would be gathered from dreaming creatures, and you would do so with the item St. Trina's Crystal Ball. There are a lot of cut icons for this particular questline, 
that really highlights the vast variety of creatures that could be harvested for this purpose. Though I note these icons are from a previous iteration of the quest, but I digress, it just shows how many creatures could have had their dream stuff harvested. Now, while this is interesting in of itself, because it confirms St. Trina's association with dreams, but Rico says some other things that hint as to what the use of such dreams could be, and ultimately how terrifying St. Trina's domain is. In Lance's video, he illustrates that if you say no to Rico in helping him brew dream brew, he would try and entice you by saying the following. Well, suit yourself, but I'm sure you'll be after a drink before long. Perhaps you'll tire of this crumbling world. Or, maybe you'll wish to uncover someone's deepest, darkest secrets. But what does this mean? Well, in his video, Lance illustrates the use of Dream Brew on Kali. After brewing some, he gives it to this NPC. Upon drinking, they then fall asleep. And then, during Kali's sleep dialogue, the subtitles reveal his deepest nightmare, as if we are watching him dream. And it's about him being scorched by the frenzied flame. The NPC Rico is actually revealed by Lance to be a monk, presumably a monk of St. Trina. Thus, we can assume that the act of brewing a dream brew and reading dreams is almost a religious process, which does seem to be confirmed by another of his dialogues where he would have said, As you surely know, my compeer, I am but a humble man of the cloth, and I must profess the study of alcohol is but another form of worship. O oh, St. Trina, my faith is in alcohol and the hearts of men. To me, this implies the sheer power of St. Trina's connections to dreams, that she's able to freely find out anyone's secrets and deepest desires, seeing into the hearts of men by scouring the unconscious mind. This is, of course, a fitting counterpart to Mikla, who appears to have the power to control the conscious mind through his bewitching powers of compulsion. If Mikla and St. Trina are one and the same, good grief, he would really be a god to fear, a being who is able to manipulate the conscious and unconscious minds of men. While these are mere thematic overlaps with Mikla, however, there is an outright connection to Mikla in this cut quest. Rico eventually moves to seek St. Trina himself, and so he heads to the Halig Tree. There, he would track Moog's kidnap of Mikla from the snowfield through the bloody portal and into Mogwin Palace. Here, Rico comes across a revelation of his saint's true identity, as he would have said, Finally, I have found it. St. Trina's, no, Lord Mikola's cadaver. I have partaken of untold secrets, such that I might aid you, O Lord. So please, I hope you can welcome your humble servant Rico into your dream, the world of your heart. Indeed, I beg you grant my wish that when you transcend from Empyrean to God, allow me a place by your side." So this outright states that Mikola and St. Trina are one. And again, like I say, whilst this was cut late in development, I think we can consider this is still the direction that the lore is pointing in. Even if the details of this quest didn't quite mesh with what's in the game, I still think it's clear that we're meant to think that St. Trina and Mikola are one. The extra part of his dialogue seems to again reinforce the idea that St. Trina's powers and the benefit of them are to be able to scour the unconscious mind, that no mortal man would be able to hide a secret from their powers over dreams. There is one final facet of St. Trina's cut questlines that help reinforce the idea that Trina is just another persona of Mikla because the saint has similar objectives to Mikla. Mikla is of course concerned with the warding away of the outer gods, and it's therefore fascinating that cut content regarding Kali and the Frenzied Flame would also have featured a reference to St. Trina, and it's thanks to the extraordinary work of Sekiro Dubi that we are able to see this, as Sekiro Dubi has again partially restored this deleted questline. And I highly recommend you check out this fantastic video, which will be linked below. In this cut questline, the nomadic NPCs would have had a far bigger role, and Sekiro Dubi shows us how one of the cut merchants would tell us that the reason they play music is to calm the frenzied flame within his people. The merchant would also explain how this music, the music they play, is derived from an old lullaby that used to be sung to them within their tomb. Now that he mentions it, there is certainly something of a lullaby in the melody that the merchants play.
Following this, Kali would give you the Sint Trina Crystal Ball. Sekiro Dubi explains that this version of the Sint Trina quest must have predated the Rico one, giving the Rico one still partially existed within the network test, which would explain why the Sint Trina Crystal Ball and the Dream Gathering mechanic is present in both of these cut questlines. They're from different stages of development. With that said, the item description for the St. Trina Crystal Ball, shown both by Lance and Sekiro Dubi, seems to have more to do with this previous questline, as it talks about St. Trina of the Cradle Song, i.e. of the Lullaby, and the rest of the item description talks about calming the Frenzied Flame. It's clear that in this iteration of the St. Trina quest, you would gather Dream Fog in order to help Kali calm the Frenzied Flame of his people that the calming effect of dreams would calm the frenzied flame of the nomadic people. Sekiro Dubi believes that the implication here is that St. Trina was the one who used to sing the lullaby to the nomads within their tomb, to calm their spirit and the flame within them, given her epithet of the Cradle Song, and the massive role that St. Trina plays in this quest of harvesting dream fog. Indeed, this also lines up with the description of Trina's Lily, that is still in the base game, as its item description tells us that it calms the spirit and prevents agitation. But again, I highly recommend you check out Sekiro Dubi's full video on this questline, as he goes far deeper into the lore than I am here. However, my main takeaway from this questline is that again, even at this point in development, St. Trina, likely an alter ego of Mikola, was concerned with forestalling the frenzied flame, the power of an outer god. And with all of this evidence in mind, I think it's pretty clear that St. Trina is Mikola. Whether it's an alter ego, or like I suggested earlier, another personality altogether, much like Marika and Radigan, is up for debate. We talked about Mikola's parentage before and how it's quite unusual and it likely led to him becoming eternally young, so it wouldn't be too surprising if he then had another alternate ego existing within him, given his mother and father, who are both his parents in one body, also have a similar situation. I hope we get some answers regarding St. Trina in the DLC, and it does seem at least that we will be getting some more content regarding St. Trina, since, as pointed out by Quaylag here on Twitter, there is a scene in the trailer that shows a sleeping person among St. Trina's lilies. So I'm very excited to see what happens next, but overall the story of St. Trina very much augments that of Mikola. And if St. Trina is a hidden personality of Mikola, it would make sense that he keeps this a secret. After all, some may view St. Trina's habits of harvesting the thoughts and fears of the unwilling as surreptitious, and against Mikola's vow to rid the world of meddling gods. But let me know your thoughts on St. Trina in the comments below. Mikola had everything in place for his ascension to godhood. He had his own version of an Erd tree, and he had his own Lane Dell in the form of Elfael. Filled with devout followers and loyal soldiers, Mikola commanded a fearsome army, and he also commanded respect. With the greatest swordswomen in the lands at his side, his ascension appears to have been inevitable, the best suited, poised to take the shattered and vacant throne. So what happened? Well, the DLC trailer does offer some new insights into Mikola's actions, but let's try and assess what's left in the base game before we touch on that. We looked at the Halig Tree Crest Circle earlier, that tells us that the Halig Tree failed to become an Erd Tree, and the Halig Tree Crest Great Shield, wielded by Mikola's knights, reads the following. Yet now, with the Halig Tree misshapen, this wondrous rendition is a fleeting fantasy. So something failed with the Halig Tree, it's now a broken, misshapen husk, a far cry from the Erd Tree itself. For me, there are three main factors that we must consider when we try to understand the fall of the Halig Tree. Number one, Mikola simply misunderstood the process of making an Erd Tree, and thus it failed. Two, Moog interfered. And three, Melania's rot infected the tree. Let's start by looking at factor number one. Shadow of the Erd Tree promises to answer some of the questions surrounding the gestation of the Erd Tree, as in an interview with Famitsu, Miyazaki said the following. In fact, the land of shadows is the place where Marika became a god and the golden tree was born. 
Given the ominous twisted tree in the horizon of the Lands of Shadows, it becomes clear that Marika did something here to create the Golden Tree. Therefore, Mikla growing his own Erd Tree maybe isn't as simple as cultivating one of the minor Erd Trees and watering it with his own blood. We don't know what ritual or process Marika used to create the Golden Tree in the first place. Whether or not this is true or relevant, there are two other aggravating factors that clearly contributed to the downfall of the Halig Tree, and the first is of course the actions of Moog and his interference. Indeed, when you reach the Halig Tree and report this to Gideon Ofnir, he has a dialogue that suggests the reason the Halig Tree is as it is, i.e. misshapen, is because Mikla is no longer there. As he says, But with the Halig Tree as it is, I suppose Mikola must already be. I heard speculation Mikola embedded himself in the Halig Tree. But before he could finish, someone cut the tree open and absconded with his infant form. One of the first images we see in the entire game is Moog stealing Mikola from his cocoon. And of course, we do eventually find the body of Mikola resting in the clutches of Moog alongside this broken cocoon. Moog's intentions are well known at this stage, but just for the sake of completeness, let us look at the description of his remembrance, which reads, Wishing to raise Mikla to full godhood, Moog wished to become his consort, taking the role of monarch. But no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Imperian. Moog wanted to institute a new order of blood, in which he would be the Lord of Blood to replace the Elden Lord, and Mikla would become the God of Blood of this new era. Moog needs a God of Blood, and hence he seeks out an Imperian, candidates for Godhood, and he corrupts the physical form of Mikla with his omen blood, and yet he receives no response from Mikla. I discussed why I thought Mikla was catatonic in my Mikla lore video from about two years ago. I suggested it is to do with his cocooning process that had been unnaturally interrupted by Moog, thus he was in a coma because this transformative process had been disturbed. It's clear that Mikla cocooned himself. The aforementioned image of him and Moog shows that Mikla has insect-like wings, again suggesting an insect-like process of metamorphosis, brought about by a period within a cocoon. In the wall of the Halig Tree, where we fight Melania, there is an impression or relief in the wall that looks like Mikla, and there is a large gap beneath this relief, the perfect size for Mikla's cocoon. As I suggested in that old video, there is a good chance this is where Mikla's cocoon once rested, before it was ripped out of the wall of the Halig Tree by Moog. I suggest that this Mikla imprint we see in the wood of the Halig Tree is evidence of Mikla becoming one with his Halig Tree his attempt to ascend to Godhood by becoming one with his holy tree. Perhaps Moog's interruption of this process contributed to the Halig Tree dying. That at least was my thoughts two years ago. Of course, the trailer for Shadow of the Erd Tree has changed my perspective on this somewhat. The Bandai Namco flavour text for the DLC tells us that Mikla divested himself of his flesh in order to come to the Land of Shadows. Indeed, Mikla even appears at the end of the trailer, in his youthful and radiant form, despite his corrupted flesh left behind in Moog's palace. His spirit has somehow transcended into this other realm, leaving his corporeal flesh behind. It was a purposeful act, because he wanted to come here. Therefore, I now speculate that Mikla's cocooning process was less to do with him ascending and becoming one with his tree, and more to do with his transference of spirit into the Land of Shadows. Perhaps this also explains the cocoons of his followers found around the Halig Tree, those desperate to join their lord in the Land of Shadows. Multiple times throughout this video we've looked at the quote from Melania that comes from her armour set. As I said in my trailer breakdown video, I used to believe that this was just a vain hope of Melania, some copium to help her deal with the fact that her brother is gone. However, I now believe that Melania is not delusional in the belief of her brother, that she knows his true aim was to travel to the Land of Shadows. This is why she knows that despite the loss of his body, Mikla is not out of the fight yet, and in fact his body is now largely irrelevant. 
His spirit has departed his body and it's basically a useless cadaver now. This is why Moak has never been able to get an answer from Mikla. He is just in the possession of a useless body. And if you think about it, this makes Moog's delusions of grandeur even sadder, as it was all pinned on Mikla, who was never going to awaken as the god of blood. Mikla is still in control and his plans are still in motion. Even two years ago, I did ponder whether Mikla was somehow turning this to his advantage. And yet, Mikla's story isn't finished. We don't know if Mikla himself is finished. While obviously things aren't great, we have to consider that Mikla compels all of those around him to love him, and it appears that Moog is no different. Moog isn't immune to his effects, and we see how much he seems to, in his own psychotic mindset, love and care for Mikola. Is it possible that deep within his slumber, Mikola is still pulling the strings? When I said that, however, I obviously didn't know what exactly that could mean. I certainly didn't imagine that Mikola had already left his body and transcended to another realm, I was mainly referring to the fact that Mikla seems to be wise, and too wise to be defeated in the manner that he was. Fatih recently released a video called The Lore of Elden Ring is Cursed, an excellent video which, for some reason if you haven't watched, I highly recommend. In this video, Vati made a fascinating suggestion. He highlighted the fact that the DLC flavour text tells us that Mikla divested himself of his flesh and his grace to come to the Land of Shadows. Vati suggests that in order to divest himself of his grace, Mikola allowed Moog to defile his flesh with his omen blood, pointing out the fact that the omen are graceless beings, and by defiling his body with omen blood and the omen infection, so to speak, the grace would be removed from his body. I really like this idea, and it would be really next level 4D chess if it turned out to be true. So yeah, please check out Vati's video. And if you also wanted an explanation as to why the Omen are considered to be graceless beings, then I do go into this in my Dung Eater and the Omen Curse video, which I'll also link below. As to how the Lands of Shadow play into his greater plan of freeing his sister and banishing the influence of the Outer Gods, we will just have to wait and see. Perhaps Mikla seeks the ability to finally make the Halic Tree a true Erd Tree by discovering Marika's secret and how she first created the Golden Tree. Or perhaps he simply seeks to undo her works so that a true unalloyed order may be established. But returning to the fall of the Halig Tree, the final aggravating factor is of course Melania's Rot. In my Melania lore video, which I would refer you to if you want more detail, I argued that Melania's Ionian Bloom at Caelid was the first time that she bloomed and unleashed the Scarlet Rot Goddess within her which would explain why prior to this, Melania's presence at the Halig Tree didn't afflict the tree at all. She was able to keep the Scarlet Rot under control. However, after her fateful duel with Radan and the subsequent Rot Cataclysm, we know that she is rendered unconscious and carried back to the Halig Tree by Finlay. As Finlay's ashes read, Finlay was one of the few survivors of the Battle of Eonia, who in an unimaginable act of heroism, carried the slumbering demigod Melania all the way back to the Halig Tree. She managed the feat alone, fending off all manner of foes along the way. Melania was unconscious upon her return, and so I suggest that her rot began to seep out and infect the Halig Tree, and it does so root and stem. Even at the top of the tree at the branches, we can see evidence of the rot, and within the inner reaches of the Halig Tree, we can see there are great waterfalls and rivers of rot. The people here are infected by the rot. Even the Crystallians and the Halig Tree avatars have fallen to its influence. So whatever else led the Halig Tree to fail, I think it's patently clear that Melania's rot was the final blow, infecting the Halig Tree from within. The rot's consumption of the Halig Tree goes beyond the physical as well. It's also symbolic. As in a lot of ways, the tree has become less about Mikla's unalloyed order and more about Melania's order of rot. On the tree's branches, we find the Oracle Envoys. The spirit ashes for the Oracle Envoys tell us that these mysterious beings appear when they are here to herald in a new god or a new age. They are here for Melania, who is on the verge of godhood. Indeed, the lower levels of the Halig Tree now belong to the Scarlet Rot and the Kindred of Rot. 
the kindred are gathered here in worship of their mother, guarding her sanctum and celebrating her nigh divinity. This is not what Melania wanted, and yet it is what the Halic Tree has now become. Mikla's people thus clung to this dying husk of a tree, and with their lord absent it seems as though they have little left, and yet they are still here. Their faith in their lord remains despite the terrible state of their people, and it looks as though their faith is well warranted, as the most fearsome Empyrean of all has still been advancing his plans this entire time despite his disappearance. I can't wait to see what happens, but all we know for certain is that Mikla is a being of great intelligence and influence, and we should go into the DLC respecting him, but also fearing him. So thanks guys, that is my take on Mikla as it stands before the DLC. I've wanted to do this video for a while, as the Mikla video I did was a long time ago and my style has improved since then, and my ideas have changed somewhat about Mikla. I also wanted to do this before the DLC drops, mainly to get people caught up on the lore of Mikla as there's a lot to it, but also so it can stand here before the DLC changes everything. I like this moment in history, so to speak, before we go into the DLC. Everything regarding Mikla will definitely change then, and I thought it would be an interesting project to do a full in-depth analysis of Mikla as it stands now. And I will be doing more of these catch-up videos in the near future, so again, like and subscribe if you'd like to see more. First of all, a big thank you to the talented Eugenia Liza for allowing me to use her Centrina project as a backdrop for the Centrina chapter, as it's a great visual aid for that aspect of Mikla's lore. Shout out to Raditaskor, Monster Maze, and Cyrobe for discussing the subject of Mikla with me in public and private as it allowed me to reinforce my existing ideas that I already had in the subject and come to some certain conclusions. So again, thank you to you all and they're all linked below. And finally, some thanks to Last Protagonist for those translations that were quoted throughout the video. But until next time guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments below about this Imperian and his lore, and until next time I will see you in the Land of Shadows. Take care and have a wonderful evening.